Hi, everybody. My name is Thomas Rokicki. It is uh, such an honor to be able to come here and talk to you a little bit about some work I've done with uh, Gil Dogan. Can everybody hear me? OK, excellent, excellent. So what we've done is um, we were inspired to look at Gollum rulers. Now, I'm sure you guys all know what Gollum rulers are. Um, it was in uh, Scientific American, March 1972. Um, and essentially what it is is it's a set of numbers whose, whose differences are all unique. So if I take any pair of this set of numbers, the differences between them are different than any other pair. So for the sequence 0, 1, 4, 6, I've got four marks, four numbers. And there are six different pairs I can take from those. The differences between the values of those six pairs are all unique. Um, the next example, I've got five marks. I've got values from 0 to 11. And there are 10 unique distances there. Now, there's one distance missing, because if there's 10 distances, but the length is 11, there must be some value that I can't measure. So this is different from sparse rulers. These are just Gollum rulers. Now, it's easy to come up with a ruler that measures unique distances. It's very, very long. I can just pick marks that are just powers of two, no problem. What we really want to do is get the shortest ruler that's got as many marks as possible, while maintaining this, distinction, this distinctness property. So here's an example of a ruler with a lot of marks. So anyway, um, <laughs> Martin Gardner introduced this to us in 1972. And when this happened, all of us in the uh, microcomputer world were just saying, oh, cool, let me, let me try this. Let me see what I can do with it. So a bunch of people started writing programs. Can we explore what, you know, the optimal ruler space? What's the shortest ruler we can come up with? So there's a sequence of people. Mixon did some early results, Robinson. Um, James Sher at IBM, Silbert, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just expanded. So right now, there are thousands of computers working on this problem across the world in a distributed .NET thing. So they're working right now on the 28 mark ruler, trying to find the shortest ruler with 28 marks. And um, let's see, why isn't this going? There we go. So the, the interesting thing about this is, I mean, people have been looking at this for decades, and we haven't been able to come up with a better way to prove a ruler is optimal other than just simply trying all the possibilities, essentially. And we've burned thousands of CPU years on this. So right now we're looking at OGR28. What we're trying to do is we're hoping to find some ruler that's shorter than any that's known. So, okay, so in other words, we know some set of rulers. We're trying to find shorter ones. This has not happened for all these decades of computation since, since back in 1986 when someone found a new ruler for 16. So here's some statistics. And as you can see, I mean, there's just billions and billions and billions of nodes being processed all the time. And lots of people dialing in, et cetera. So the interesting thing is we actually know how to build pretty good rulers. Okay, There's algebraic techniques that we can use to build these rulers. And these rulers that are built using these techniques have been shown to be optimal for all the sizes from 17 through 27 so far. Well, probably going to happen again for, 19, for 28, but we don't know that for sure. So to make this a little bit fun, I'm going to actually tell you how you can construct one of these rulers, one of these near optimal rulers with pencil and paper. And we're going to tie it into the Fibonacci sequence. So this is all, all well-known stuff. It's, it's you know, been available for a while. I'm just sharing it with you because it's interesting. So I don't need to tell you guys anything about the Fibonacci sequence. You'll see it plenty if you haven't seen it already. Um, so what we're going to do, though, is we're going to put a little riff on it. We're going to say the Fibonacci sequence modulo some value p. So for instance, for p is equal to 3, I'm going to, after I add each number, I'm going to modulo it with 3. And I'm going to get this new sequence, 0, 1, 1, 2, 0, 2, 2, 1. So the 1 plus 2, I add it, I get 3. Modulo 3, I get 0. This sequence is going to repeat at some point, because there's only a finite number of values there. And it's going to repeat with a period of less than p squared. The maximum period is going to be p squared minus 1. We're only going to get. Gollum rulers if we hit the maximum period. So you want to look for values that give you the maximum period. This only happens for p is equal to 2 and 3 for the standard Fibonacci sequence. So what can we do about that? Well, let's change the Fibonacci sequence a little bit. 
instead of adding two consecutive numbers in the sequence, I'm going to add some weighted sum of the previous two values. So I'm taking a times the previous value plus b times the current value to give me the next value, okay? And this only works for prime p. I can only get a maximum period for prime p, the p squared minus one. But I can easily find values of a and b that gives me that maximum period just by randomly trying a few. Now this is, to me, is fantastic. You can just pick out some random values of A and B, work it out. If it's not a maximal period, just try another set. And typically, very quickly, you'll find a pair that works. So example, for P is equal to five, I can set A and B is equal to two, and I end up with this sequence, and it repeats after 24 iterations. Okay, so if you look at one particular place, I take three and two, three plus two is five, I double it, 10, and then modulo five is zero, okay? So now I've got this long sequence, it's got p squared minus one values. What can I do next? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take sequential pairs of the values in that sequence, and I'm gonna fill a table. And the way I'm gonna fill those table, that table is I'm gonna take those two sequential pairs, I'm gonna treat it as indices. So for instance, I'm going to take the 0 and 1, that's the 0th value and the first value, and I'm going to treat 0 as the x and 1 as the y, and this is the 0th pair, the first pair that happens, I'm going to put a 0 in that location. And I repeat this sequence and I fill in this table. I've got p squared minus 1 values, I'm going to use all the values from 0 to p squared minus 1, and there's not going to be a value at 0, 0, because I'm never going to hit 0, 0 again. Okay, so I fill up this square, and what do I do next? What I do is I pick any row in the square, horizontal, vertical, diagonal, doesn't matter, and take those values and sort them. And that will give me a Gollum ruler. Indeed, it gives me better than a Gollum ruler. It actually gives me a modular ruler. This Gollum ruler works not only from one, one mark to another mark, but it also works wrapping around modulo the p squared minus one value, okay? So this is really cool because um, I can now massage this modular ruler in a large number of ways to generate additional, um, additional rulers. So there's, this is sort of what we're doing. So now we've got a circular ruler and I can measure my distances around the circle, okay? Now the, the cool thing about modular rulers is every subset of a modular ruler is a modular ruler. And every modular ruler is a Gollum ruler. So what I can do is, oh, the cool thing is, if I multiply every element by a modular ruler by a constant relatively prime to my modulus, I will get a modular ruler back. And then I can generate column rulers from that. So I can enumerate all of these and walk through and actually derive column rulers, short column rulers from that. So we've known this for 60, 70 years or something like that, and we've done this um, a lot. Um, so what we did, is we actually generated all of these rulers and we noticed, and okay, so I'm running out of time. Um, we've noticed that, um, we've noticed that these rulers always generate subquadratic rulers. And so here's a bunch of statistical data that says yes, we've always gotten statistical uh, subquadratic rulers through 40,000. Um, so there's a hypothesis that says that always happens, but it turns out that doesn't work at 492,116. We cannot use these algebraic methods to generate a subquadratic ruler at this size. And this is the first size that that happens. So that's really the main point of my talk. This is the first number at which these algebraic methods do not generate a subquadratic ruler. And that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>